invite you to rise for the reading this day from the book of John in the New Testament. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around Jesus and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else. And no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I don't know how many of you saw my post on Facebook Thursday, but uh, I referenced the fact that there are hardly ever is a day that is dull for the pastor. So Thursday morning, I was walking in from the park parking lot and Cammie, the preschool director, was walking towards me at a furious pace, and she had two screwdrivers and a wrench in her hands. And, you know, you're just getting to work, and you don't want to really deal with anything that early, but anytime the preschool director has wrenches and a screwdriver, and she's coming from this part of the building, that starts to make me nervous. And so I thought to myself, if I just say good morning and keep my eyes focused straight ahead, I can make it to my office, except in the back of my mind were the words, you can deal with it now, or you can deal with it later. So I said, hey, Cammie, good morning. What's going on? She said, well, the city turned off the water, and then they turned the water back on, and we're getting ready for a Mother's Day program in East Hall and all of a sudden we heard something running and the men's urinal in the old bathroom is now overflowing and will not stop so the water is flooding out of the bathroom. I shouldn't have asked. I said okay so I dropped my stuff and I walked into the bathroom and there was our faithful administrator for joyful worship and spiritual growth bailing water out of the urinal and into the sink so that the water would stay at bay because as the urinal was running, the drain was also not draining very well. And Tammy was so kind when I walked in, there were a lot of things she could have said, but she said, uh, other duties as assigned. And I said, absolutely but give me the bucket. So I took the bucket and I started to bail and when the water was down I pulled out my phone and looked for a YouTube video on how to turn off water on a 1965 urinal because it's not the same as the new stuff down the hall. And so this plumber has loaded a video of how to turn off the water of this exact kind of equipment. But then I looked down at the bottom, and you would think a plumber would be succinct because obviously if you're watching a video of how to turn off the water, there's probably water coming at you somehow. But the video is seven and a half minutes long. I do not have seven minutes. So I put the phone down, and I start to bail. And I count out, and I realize I have about 30 seconds from when I finish bailing until the water's going to be up around my feet again. So I grab the screwdriver because he's already talked about a place where you can turn off the valve. I put the video back on and he, he then shows where the little cap is. You pop off to put the screwdriver in and turn the valve off. It all makes sense. The cap is off, but I can't see into the tube. So now I've stopped the video and I've got the flashlight on on my phone. But what is happening? My feet are getting wet. So I begin to bail again. I put the phone down, the screwdriver down. I bail and I bail. And when the water is down again, I pick up the flashlight and I hold the screwdriver. But you know what? Ugh, I'm getting old. 
And so now the eyes don't focus so well up close, and I hate that. And so I'm like just trying to jam it in there. And I finally find the little tiny, you know, slit that the screwdriver goes into. And so I try to twist it, and what do you think happens to a 1965 plumbing apparatus? It doesn't move. So I put the phone down. I see the water. I put both hands on that screwdriver, and as I start to twist, all of the plumbing out of the wall in the top of the urinal starts to move with it. <laughs> And I've seen enough cartoons to know if I keep going, the water is going to explode into my face. But my feet are already wet, so does it matter if the rest of me is wet? And so I put the screwdriver back in and I twist, and finally, the water starts to decrease. Not completely, but it goes down. So we take a breath. I come into the office. Tammy's already called for the plumber. 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, the plumber shows up. I go back in with the plumber in to the restroom to talk about what our options are with the 1965 piece of equipment. And not five minutes in there, as he's explaining how they used to put urinals in with a box of sand and concrete, I don't care, but he's telling me the whole story, which was so wonderful of him if he ever watches this sermon. And Tammy comes running back into the bathroom. Pastor Chris, there are children stuck in the elevator. <laughs> and you know those moments when you, when you hear it? but you have to process it before you can decide what is next to do. So I heard it, and my first response is, what do you want me to do with this information? But Pastor Chris has a long-standing tradition of doing his best to save the world. So I take off down the hallway. I yell at the director of administration and say, bring the keys for the elevator, because the fireman keys, you can override the whole system. The elevator closes, it comes down to the floor. Everything will be fine. And I get down and the keys are handed to me and I put the key in and I turn it. And when you turn it to uh, on, then the elevator door upstairs should close and it should come down. Nothing happens. But if you ever want to ramp up the adrenaline in a group of people, put eight two-year-olds in an elevator without an adult and then have them cry uncontrollably. <laughs> so my heart is racing and I run down the stairs because there's no elevator now. I run down the stairs, I go down the hall, up the stairs and around and let me tell you why the elevator won't come down. Because there's a teacher stuck in the elevator door. So she's on one side of the elevator. She's got her arm in the door. The door is closed. And the two-year-olds are grabbing her arm on the other side. Do not let go. Do not let go. They can't talk, but that's what they're saying. And so she is telling them to press the button. Don't press any buttons. You don't even know what these buttons do. And in that moment, I realize I am woefully inept to deal with this crisis. There are seven people staring at me, and I look at them and I say, call 911. So someone picks up their phone and they call 911, and the teacher's holding her own, and the children are crying, and then the teacher comes back and says, the fire truck is on its way. This is wonderful news. We live in Waukesha. We have a little bit of road construction, but it's not bad. I know where the two closest fire departments are, but when you call 911 and you wait for the fire truck outside, that length of time feels like forever. And so, this is exactly where we pick up today with Jesus at the temple. Because Jesus is in the portico of Solomon, it's one side of the temple. Jerusalem is not that big a city, and this this portico is a porch. It's a covered porch that has columns going down both sides. And it is literally one of the largest gathering spaces in the entire city of Jerusalem. And so it is of no surprise that Jesus chooses to be in this portico because this portico is also the place where good and faithful believers go through with their sacrifices to the temple, and then when they leave, they go right back through. And if, in the days of Jesus, if people are anything like they are today, when a crowd gathers, people stop. 
because they want to know what's going on. And so there's a crowd gathered around Jesus. And then someone tells Jesus this. How long? How long will you keep us in suspense? Tell us plainly if you are the Messiah, if you are the chosen one of God. How long will you keep us in suspense? Just tell us. We've got to take a step back for a second because you probably missed how the day started. Remember where John started the scripture today. He says, at the time the festival of the dedication took place, you would know that festival better under the name Hanukkah, or Festival of Lights. And the tradition is that uh, in Jewish belief, we're honoring um, the, can the, all the oil that never went out over eight days. But the tradition is every night of Hanukkah, you light another candle, and as the light grows, so too does the knowledge grow. And John, who writes the book of John, has this great way. He loves to do kind of that symbolic imagery stuff. And so John spends his time talking about light and dark and how that teaches people about belief in Jesus. So it is no wonder that even in the midst of the festival of lights, that we're dealing with people who still are in the dark about who Jesus really is. In the book of John, one of the most important threads that run through the story of Jesus is about belief. The question comes up, will the audience that John is writing to, will they believe in the message of hope and God's love? And more specifically, will they believe in Jesus? Because in John, Jesus doesn't just do miracles. Jesus offers signs. So Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding. Jesus heals a blind man. The miracle is not about God's power, but it's about the invitation to believe in Jesus. If you think back in the book of John, there's the story of Nicodemus, a Jewish leader who comes at night. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, everyone who believes in me will not die, but have eternal life. Belief is connected to eternal life with Nicodemus and this moment today. But what I love most about the story today is that Jesus doesn't ask anyone to sign a statement of doctrine. Jesus doesn't say when you can recite this creed or if you follow this order of worship or if you give this much offering, Jesus doesn't even command the people who have gathered around him to follow. There is simply an invitation to entrust one's life into the hands of God. I wonder if you should hear that again. Don't get me wrong, I love the Apostles' Creed because it builds this foundation for our understanding of who God is to us. And in order of worship, either in traditional worship or praise band worship here at 1045, there is a flow to how we do things and it carries you to this moment of preaching and then it carries you to the moment where you are able to taste God's promise in bread and wine. And I am grateful for every dollar and every minute you give in sacrifice to God. And of course, of course, Jesus calls each of us to follow. But all of that comes after. All of it comes after each of us considers the invitation to entrust our lives in the hands of God. It turns out, because I know some of you need the end of the story, that the fire truck came and the teacher got unstuck and the children walked out of the elevator and literally 30 seconds after the children came out, they all stopped crying and the teacher said, do you want to have lunch? And they were like, okay. <laughs> and so that was the end of the story for the children and the teacher. But Pastor Chris came walking down the hall, and the plumber was waiting for me. And so I finished with the plumber, 
And as I came back to the office, guess who was waiting? The elevator repairman who said, eh, it's going to run you about four digits, maybe five to get this fixed. Of course it is. Of course it is. If only every story of suspense was so easily and neatly wrapped up when the story ended. We know not every story ends happily or peacefully or joyfully, certainly not easily. Because the stories of our lives are almost always more involved and far more complicated than can be answered and resolved with a simple yes or no when everything comes to its conclusion. Many of you know that I work with the youth gathering for the national church, and so every three years we gather 30, 35,000 high school students together. In 2021, we will be in Minneapolis. And I often hear other adults tell me through the planning process, if we can just get high school students to believe that Jesus died for them, then they will be okay. And a dear friend and colleague will always argue the point. She argues the point that belief is hard. Trust is a little bit easier, and it's a lot more than semantics. She will tell me that belief, inviting someone to believe, is always weighed down with the baggage of what others tell you you must believe. And for a high school student, let alone a cynical adult, belief always comes with baggage. It is a long and drawn out journey. And high school students and adults both are suspicious of authority and institution and even the idea that only one truth can be true for all the world. For many people, belief is often yoked with being pressured or bullied. But trust, trust is surrendering yourself. It is not claiming the belief of someone else. Trust is placing your own life in the hands of God, which can and often lead someone to belief. But the absolute of your faith, your trust, your hope, your peace, it is not based on someone else's opinion. Your faith is based on your own trust in God's deep and abiding love for you and God's promise of eternal life. Now, did you hear that right? Not your salvation, not God's promise of you going to heaven, There's no level of faith for that. Your trust is based on your own vulnerability. That God loves you so much that you're willing to entrust your life to God's hands. And that, my friends, is worth a moment of suspense, not because you are waiting for Jesus to answer the question, We already know the end of the story. The cross stands empty and the power of death does not have the last word. And in the joy of resurrection light, Jesus comes as the light of the world. And in that bright light, you are invited to trust the good news of great joy that the angels shouted so long ago. And to entrust your life into the hands of of our God. Thanks be to God. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.